Welcome back, everybody, to the Seattle Sonics, my NBA franchise here on NBA 2K22. We've got a big episode today previewing this year's upcoming NBA draft, and we will be also doing the draft lottery shortly. Last episode, we recapped the season with the Clippers winning the finals, Giannis winning MVP, and Dwight Howard and Carmelo Anthony being inducted into the Hall of Fame. But that's last year. We're now entrenched into the offseason, going to go through everything up until the draft today. I promise we will get to the draft lottery in a minute, but first we're going to do staff signing just so we can get this part done, and then after that, the rest of the video will be focused on NBA draft stuff. So we need a new head scout because that position is not filled, and the guy who I like here is Larry Justice. He seems to know what he's doing. Four years, 350K, I think that's a fair contract. I wanted to add another domestic scout. I want to get someone to be scouting more high school players because with the one-and-done rule being abolished for next year, we will be seeing some more high schoolers in the upcoming draft for 2023. And then I wanted a perimeter defense coach because I feel our perimeter defense last year was not great. So far, only the head scout accepted. The domestic scout is mulling, and the perimeter defense coach doesn't really like our offer, and he would eventually block us. So that's not ideal. Even though we're his only offer, he really does not want to come here. I don't know why. So we're going to have to go after a new perimeter defense coach. And luckily, he, along with our domestic scout, would accept. So now we have the maximum amount of staff positions filled. And now it's time for the spectacle itself, the draft lottery. I left you guys on a cliffhanger at the end of the last episode entering the lottery. But now it's time. Our Sonics hold just under a 14% chance of getting the number one pick, which is better odds than any team here. What we need is for chaos not to happen as the Atlanta Hawks get the 16th pick. We do not want teams jumping into the top four because they could be stealing our spot. We could fall as low as pick five, which obviously this is a talented draft class. I'm sure we could get someone good at five. But that would not be good news. So we need as many of these to stay the same as possible. Through the first three, it's been exactly that. Atlanta at 16, Cleveland at 15, Dallas at 14. So far, so good. No major surprises. 13, projected to go to the New York Knicks, will stay with the Knicks. They continue to have zero draft lottery luck, although their chances of jumping were limited. It's very unlikely that these teams would have jumped, but now we're getting into the range where you might expect to see someone move up. It's not going to be Memphis at 12. They will hold on to their pick, but usually the 11s, the 10s, the 9s, usually somebody in this range every year jumps up. Last year, it was Cleveland. The year before, it was Charlotte. The New Orleans Pelicans will stay at 11. So, so far, still no changes through the first six. This is going really well. Exactly to plan thus far for our Sonics, but you'd have to imagine someone's going to be jumping up soon. And one of those teams will be the Indiana Pacers. They will enter the top four. The Washington Wizards will fall one spot. They pick at 10. So the Pacers are in the top four. That's not good news. How about Minnesota? Here at pick nine, they will stay at nine. The Timberwolves, like New Orleans and Memphis, have gotten some draft lottery luck over the years. But not today, which is good. How about pick eight? My Detroit Pistons. They, of course, got the number one pick last year. And the Pistons will stay at 8. It says their protected pick will go to the Thunder next year, but 2K's protections are all wrong. So if the Pistons don't, I think, make the playoffs in the 2023 season, they would still keep that pick. So I'll make sure that's right. At 7, the Spurs move into the top 4, and it's the Rockets who end up with this pick. So there are four teams left for two spots. At 6, it's going to go to the Toronto Raptors. So here we go. This is where Seattle could fall. Oklahoma City, Orlando, and Seattle all could get the fifth pick, and it goes to the Thunder. So the Sonics are in the top four. We've cleared one hurdle, but we still have a few more to go. Seattle, Orlando, Indiana, and San Antonio are the teams picking in the top four in some order. Pick four will go to the San Antonio Spurs, so their lottery luck will stop here. So now it's the two worst teams in the league, along with the Indiana Pacers, who in the Cavs series last year... Indiana got the number one pick twice. So they've gotten plenty of lottery luck on this channel. Pick three will be headed to Indiana. The Sonics are now in the top two. Will it be Seattle or will it be Orlando who picks number one? Here we go. The moment of truth. The second pick will be made by the Orlando Magic. And this means only one thing. Our Seattle Sonics had the number one pick 
in the NBA draft. How about that? On this channel, we have gotten cursed out so many times by the draft lottery, but not today. The Seattle Sonics will be picking number one in their first NBA draft after joining as an expansion team. Wow, how about that? I was not expecting to get the number one pick, and this puts us in a really interesting spot going into this draft preview. So we can pick anybody we want to in the entire class, but there are a couple of dilemmas that I do want to go over because we have options, and it kind of feels like we have too many options. In my opinion, this is not an overly top-heavy draft class. There are great players at the top of this draft, but I think this class has more depth than more elite players. So trading down is absolutely going to be something we consider. There are some interesting trade offers in the finder for a lot of proven players like Bam Adebayo, De'Aaron Fox, DeMar DeRozan, DeMontis Sabonis, Carl Anthony Towns. I mean, these are really good players, but I'm not looking for a guy like that right now, a veteran. I would, If I do trade down, I'd rather it be for a lot of picks because keep in mind, with the one-and-done rule being abolished, the top prospects for the high school class of 2022 and the high school prospects of 2023 will all be in one draft class. So if we do move down, we will prioritize getting first round picks next year along with a pick this year. I'm obviously going to make sure we have a somewhat high pick in this year's draft as well. That would be kind of dumb if we did it. But if we do move down, I will prioritize adding future first round picks, particularly next year. But that's if we want to move down. We might just want to say, hey, we can pick anybody we want. Why risk somebody falling? Why not just get our guy and go from there? So let's go run through the positions and try to figure out if we want to move down or if we want to stay put. Chidubem Iheririka is the top point guard in the class. None of the point guards are projected to go really in the top five. So Iheririka here would be one of the trade down candidates, likely towards the bottom half of the top ten. He's a small guard at six foot, but he's a really talented offensive player. He's pretty much campaign, but better, essentially. So if we want to get him to run our offense, we would likely move down to the pick six or seven range, and I'm sure we could get multiple additional first round picks in return. There are other point guards we could look at. UCLA's Oscar J. Basilan is a great example. I think he is more upside than any point guard in this draft class. Standing at six foot four, has ridiculously long yarns. I believe his wingspan is around 6'10". He's an all-NBA level defender right now. Good playmaker. Pretty good scorer as well. He's not as polished as an offensive player as Chidubem Iheririka, but I think his upside, his size, and his length really make him interesting. Another trade-down candidate would be the German native Johannes Kleber, who played for Alba Berlin last season. If we want to move down for him, I think we could go as far as back down to pick 10 or 11 and get multiple future assets. I think Kleber is a borderline top five prospect in this draft, so I think doing that could make a lot of sense if that's the route we want to go to. He's not a blue chip prospect in this draft, but I think he's at that next tier, and you have a fair argument to make the case that he is the best point guard in this draft. I think these top three point guards all have really good qualities about themselves, and there are other good point guards down the board who we could look at with some of our later picks. The first true blue chip player we will talk about today is Jayon Azkavan. When we talked about him earlier this season, I described him as a potential top three pick, and that notion has not changed. He is absolutely a player we will consider number one overall. I don't think there's a more talented scorer in this draft class. He needs to work on his efficiency, but quite frankly, this kid can put the ball in the bucket. Great athleticism, pretty good playmaker, pretty good defender as well. He's pretty much a better passing version of Jalen Green, who doesn't quite have the length that Jalen Green has, but really similar in terms of talent. Tony Clapp out of Washington is a player we could consider if we trade down really far from pick one or move up from 30. Now, the issue I have with this idea is I don't know if we have the assets to go from 30 to, like, pick 15, and I wouldn't want to move from pick one to pick 15, but Tony Clapp is a really intriguing prospect. Offensively, he stacks right up with guys like Jayon Azkavan as a scorer and a playmaker and an athlete. But he cannot play defense. Not that it's his fault. He definitely gives effort on that side of the floor. But he is just flat out not a good defender. 
Quite a few other good shooting guards we could consider with our two later picks as well. As we now go to small forward, one of the other true blue chip players in this class is Diami Christensen from Washington. He runs the Washington offense even as a 6'8", 210-pounded, bulky, giant wing. He has the guard ability to facilitate an offense, but also has the size to match up on threes and fours. Now, Christensen is 21 years old, which is old for a blue chip prospect. He also has some medical concerns, along with Jayon Azkaban, the other blue chip player. So these blue chip guys having medical issues is a little bit concerning, but Diami Christensen is the most pro-ready player in the draft, in my opinion, and probably the favorites win Rookie of the Year. If we want to move down a tiny bit, Zaquan Hobbs out of Gonzaga makes a lot of sense. I think he's the best non-blue chip prospect in this draft, and when I say blue chip player, those will be the guys the Sonics consider at number one. After that, when you get into that second tier, I think you're looking at guys like Zaquan Hobbs. He's a really, really talented player, can put the ball on the floor, good shooter, solid enough passer as well, good athlete, pretty good on defense. This is a well-rounded, high-floor player who I think has the chance to be really, really good, and someone who the Sonics could consider if they move down to, like, pick four or five. Another player in that range is Ziggy DiGiuste out of Kentucky. So Ziggy here originally started the season as the number one high school prospect in the nation, went to Kentucky, and it was disappointing to start the year, but he really picked it up down the stretch and has put himself back into the top ten, maybe even top five, conversation. Another high floor player who can shoot the ball and play really good defense. He has great length and size at six foot nine, 220 pounds, and I think he's a really talented kid. If Seattle were to move into the back end of a lottery, Freeman Alexander, Zaitavius Storm, and O'Shea Falcone are all players who can make sense. And then even down the board, guys like Taylor, Parker, Rayshon Brooks, really good small forward class. The third and final blue chip player in this year's draft is Buzz Wigington Jr. out of Michigan. Unlike the other two blue chippers, Buzz is the only one without medical issues, which certainly bodes well for him. This is a unicorn type of talent. He's a seven-footer who can score from all three levels. He's a really talented passer, phenomenal rim protector. For a while, he was the projected number one pick, and I would say a few months ago, had the Sonics gotten the first pick, he'd be the no-brainer choice, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Wigington had a really poor March Madness with Michigan, one of the top seeds in the nation, getting upset in the Sweet 16, and Wigington really played poorly, wasn't overly efficient, didn't play great defense, and Michigan got eliminated by the Cinderella Creighton Blue Jays, led by Apollo Steele, who has gone up more than anybody in this draft class. When we last talked about him, which was towards the end of the year, he was a second-round projected guy. Now he's projected to go in the top five. How the tables have turned. Now I said Steele had no business being a second-round guy, but even I could not have predicted his astronomical jump into the top five of this class. I think he is the top projected non-true blue chip player in this class and some of the Sonics could consider down the board. Creighton was one of the biggest underdogs going into March Madness and Steele carried them into the final four. If Seattle moves into the back end of the top 10 and Steele is gone, Isaki McDaniels from Hawaii could be a really good pick. I don't think he's quite as talented as Apollo Steele, but I think there's a lot to like with his game. This is a really well-rounded player. Not phenomenal shooting the ball. He's good from inside the arc. Great mid-range shooter. Needs to improve on his three ball. Not really much of a playmaker, but he's a very versatile defender. Solid athleticism. He can guard the post. He can guard wings. I really like him. At power forward, there's not as much depth as some of the other positions, but there is a lot of talent. And then center. Bwama Chukwumureji is a really interesting player. So he plays for Villanova, but these are his FIBA under-19 World Cup highlights because he dominated. In this game against France, who has the second-best center in the class, Chukwumureji completely dominated him. This is a 7'6 big man who has the lateral quickness of the guard. That's how I described him when we went over his prospect profile a couple of episodes ago. And you do not find players with his skill set. So if the Sonics do move down to pick four or five and still want to get that unicorn type of talent, Bwama Mureji would make a lot of sense. Teodor Chugwa II is the second projected center in this class. Now, he did get dominated in this game against Senegal, but he's really good. 
Currently, he's projected to go outside of the lottery, but he's a 79 overall, one of the highest rated players in this class. To put that into perspective, Buzz Wigington is a 79. Diami Christensen, I believe, is a 78. So, Theodore Chugwa is right in that conversation with them. I would not use a top 5 pick on him, but if the Sonics move back towards late in the top 10, look out for Theodore Chugwa. He'd make a lot of sense. When we talked about Graham Boucher earlier in the season, he was a late second round projection, and I said, look out for this kid to fly up draft boards come draft season. And once you know it, he's going to be a first rounder now, and deservedly so. One of the best interior defenders in this draft class, and say what you want about centers who can't really space the floor and aren't the most athletic, but there are still room for value for a guy like Graham Bouchard, who is athletic, and he is versatile, and he can dominate the low post. Another dominant low post big man is Obe Uche out of Illinois. Late first round projection, but he is a 78 overall. A lot of these low post centers have very high ratings, but the reason why their projection is so low is because of their lack of modern game. But despite that, I think Uche could have a role in the NBA. Like Theodore Chugwa and like Graham Boucher, Uche is a dominant presence. He's seven foot three, really athletic. He has good touch around the basket and phenomenal interior defense. So those are a lot of the players the Sonics will be considering, whether they stay at number one or they move down. And there are other players that I didn't talk about that Seattle is definitely going to be looking at towards the later portion of round one. But this episode is not over. We've still got a few stages to go, including the NBA Draft Combine. We're going to highlight some of the players we went over. Many top draft prospects don't go to the NBA Combine, but there were quite a few really good players who did. Of the top point guards, the only one who went was Oscar J. Basilan, who had the highest vertical jump out of anybody at the entire Combine at 44. Shot the ball really well, had good running times, and he was really impressive. One of the biggest winners of the Combine. Tony Clapp also did pretty well. Great sprint, 39-inch vertical jump, shot the ball pretty well, so a good showing for him as well. Quite a few other guards I liked here, Darius Watson, Charles Poole, Nathan K. Jr., Daxton Leach. As we look at small forward, Sean Brooks was outstanding. Phenomenal sprint time, 40-inch vertical jump, and he's not a great shooter, but his shooting numbers were incredibly good. Freeman Alexander did pretty well, along with Zaitavia Storm, although Storm didn't really shoot the ball that well. He's not much of a floor spacer. Ziggy Dejuiste was solid, along with O'Shea Falcone. And then DJ Taylor really tested poorly, but his game is not about athleticism, so I don't think his stock is going to go down too far. Apollo Steele wanted to boost his stock even more, and that he did. I think he might have cemented himself as a top five pick with a really, really strong combine. Isaki McDaniels was not as good as Steele, which I think cements Steele going before him. But I do like Isaki McDaniels. I think he's a top 10 player in the class. And I think overall, he was pretty solid during this combine. At the center position, we got to see Buama Chukwu Mureji. Only 12 reps on the bench. I'm a little bit disappointed, but he's only 19. He'll bulk up. A lot of these centers did not shoot the ball well, which is to be expected. But Buama did have a 41-inch vertical jump, which for someone who's 7'6", is ridiculous. Graham Boucher had a 42-inch vertical jump, which is also absurd. And then as we see going down the board, Obe Uche, 41 inches. A lot of really, really athletic players in this draft class. So for the pre-draft workouts, I wanted to go after players who we were close to having fully scouted, but not quite, or players who did not go to the combine, like Jayon Azkavan, Diami Christensen, Buzz Wigington. Even though we have those guys fully scouted, I want to see their measurables and their official combine results. So the players we'll be doing pre-draft workouts for are Christensen, Wigington, Azkavan, Apollo Steele, Zaquan Hobbs, Ziggy Dejuiste, O'Shea Falcone, Johannes Kleba, along with a couple other guys down the board, Teodora Chugwa, Tony Clapp, who had a good combine, but again, not super scouted, Graham Boucher, Rayshon Brooks. I want to see if he can replicate his incredible showing at the actual scouting combine. So as we take a look at the results, Jayon Azkavan did really well, super fast time, 43-inch vertical jump, shot the ball well. Graham Boucher, similar numbers, good combine. He's a well-deserved first-round pick. Rayshon Brooks' numbers did get a little bit worse. Maybe his combine performance was fluky, but I think he's still a big sleeper. Diami Christensen was a little bit disappointing. I would have expected more from him, but he's still definitely a guy we'll be looking at with our number one overall pick. Theodore Chugwa, 37-inch vert jump, 24 reps on the bench, and he shot the ball pretty well. Impressive showing for Chugwa. 
Tony Clapp had another good performance. Not quite as good as his actual combine, but still strong. Dejuiste was pretty good again. Falcone was fine. Zaquana Hobbs did really well. Super fast time. 44-inch vert jump. That man can fly. Johannes Kleba was phenomenal. Great shooting. Great athletic testing. He was a big winner. Apollo Steele again was pretty good. And then Buzz Wigington at the bottom. Phenomenal work from him as well. Great shooting. Pretty fast as well for someone who's 6'11", 227. Good vertical jump as well. So overall, I think this combine has given us a lot of answers. But it has not given us the answer to the question of what the hell are we going to do with the first pick. Let's take a look at some mock drafts though. We're going to take a look at three, starting with Draft Express, which has us selecting Buzz Wigington Jr., number one overall. If we stay at one, that would make a lot of sense. Him, Azkaban, or Christensen would all work with that number one pick. As we go down the board, we also get a general idea of where other players are projected to go if we want to move down, which is significant because that's certainly a strong possibility. With our other first round pick at pick 30, they have us selecting Lucas Yema, a power forward from Oklahoma. He's not really on our radar, but I don't think he's too bad. And then in the second round, Dice Moore, I do like him a lot. That'd be a really good pick at 33. 2K has us selecting Jayon Azkaban, number one. I don't have a problem with that. But DJ Taylor at 2 and Derek Gilmore at 3. N no. DJ Taylor had a really bad combine. And again, I don't think that'll hurt his stock too much. I think he's a good player. But I don't think he's going to go number 2. Derek Gilmore is not really an elite prospect. They had Buzz Wigington, I think, at 4. And like Diami Christensen at 7. I mean, this mock draft was kind of bad. Our other two picks I do kind of like, though. At 30, they have a selecting Darius Winston out of Murray State. And then Evan Creed in the second round. I'd be really happy if we ended up with those two guys with our later picks. NBA.com says better than 2K's mock draft, but worse than Draft Expresses, in my opinion, because they still have DJ Taylor going second. But other than that, Buzz Wiginton at number one makes sense. Kristensen and Azkaban at three and four, again, makes sense. Interestingly enough, they had us getting the same two players with our other two picks that Draft Express did, but in a flipped order. So they had us getting Dice Moore at 30, and at 33, they is getting Lucas Yema. So, Draft Express and NBA.com definitely agree on who we are going to get. That doesn't mean we're going to pick those players, but it is interesting that they have us getting the exact same guys, but in a little bit of a different order. So, that's going to end today's episode. I am torn on what to do with this first pick. Do we stay and pick one of the elite prospects in Azkaban, Wigington, or Christensen, or do we trade it? We have a lot of tradable contracts as well, so we'll be able to move players as we need to. And again, next year's draft class is going to be really loaded. So if we can get two or three first-round picks for next year, we could put ourselves in a really strong position to build this team up good quickly. Let me know what you think I should do in the comments. I believe the draft episode will probably be uploaded Monday or Tuesday, so make sure to stay on the lookout for that. Make sure to have a like button, make sure to subscribe, and hit the notification bell if you are new. Peace out.